Now we are going to build up the operating cash flow section of the cash flow statement using real numbers and using both the direct and indirect methods. Below is a list of transactions and balances for Johannes Inc. Cash purchases of 250, cash sales of 370, cash expenses of 40, and a depreciation expense of 55. Additionally, there is no inventory left at the end of the year. If you'd like to test yourself as we go, please download the Excel template called Johannes Periods 1 to 3 template. You should try completing period 1 before moving on to the next period. Let's work through each transaction individually. Johannes had cash purchases of 250, which we record on the income statement as an expense. This could also be referred to as cost of goods sold on the income statement. Then we record on the direct cash flow statement method cash purchases of 250. Next, Johannes has cash sales of 370, which we record as revenue on the income statement. And we record as a cash inflow on the direct cash flow statement. Next, the cash expenses of 40 are recorded as expenses on the income statement and are recorded as a cash expense on the direct cash flow statement. And next, the depreciation expense of 55 is recorded on the income statement as an expense, but is not recorded on the direct cash flow statement as it is a non-cash expense. Now, if we net all expenses from the revenues on the income statement, we arrive at net income for the period of 25. On the direct cash flow statement, if we net all of the cash inflows and cash outflows, we arrive at a change in cash of 80. Now that the income statement is finished, we can prepare the cash flow statement using the indirect method. We start by taking the net income from the bottom of the income statement of 25. We then adjust for any non-cash expenses, such as depreciation, which we add back, equal to 55. In this simplified example, there were no changes in working capital accounts on the balance sheet, so the only adjustment we have to make on the indirect method is to add back depreciation. Now, the resulting net change in cash using the indirect method is 80. Regardless of whether you use the direct method or indirect method of calculating cash flow, it should always result in the same net change in cash. Now let's look at a slightly more complicated period number two. Here are the transactions that took place during the period. Cash purchases of 280. Cash sales of 300. Sales on credit of 170. Cash expenses of 50. Receipts from receivables of 140. Depreciation of 55. And again, there is no inventory left at the end of the period. Now let's calculate the cash flow statement. Let's work through each transaction individually. Johannes had cash purchases of 280 and no inventory left at the end of the period. So purchases or cost of goods sold was 280. And cash purchases on the direct cash flow statement was also 280. Then, in terms of revenue, Johannes recorded 300 of cash sales and 170 of sales on credit. These total to combine 470 on the income statement. On the direct cash flow, only the original 300 of cash sales are recorded at this time. Next, Johannes had cash expenses of 50. So those get recorded on the income statement as expenses and on the direct cash flow method as a cash expense. There was a depreciation expense recorded in the period of 55, so that gets deducted on the income statement. Lastly, there were receipts from customers of 140, which means that the accounts receivable balance was reduced by 140 from cash that was paid on those sales that were sold on credit. Now, on the direct cash flow statement, we replace 300 of cash from sales with 440 of cash from sales.
Now, adding up the totals, we arrive at net income on the income statement of 85. And on the direct cash flow statement, we arrive at cash in of 110. Now let's calculate cash flow using the indirect method. We will begin, as always, with net income from the income statement of 85. Then we make adjustments for any changes in working capital. And we add back any non-cash expenses. So the first adjustment we need to make is the change in accounts receivable balance. At the beginning of the period, there were no accounts receivable outstanding. The end of period 1 had no accounts receivables, so that means the beginning of period 2 has no accounts receivable. Since 30 of revenue is not collected from customers, as you can see by comparing revenue on the income statement for 70 to cash from sales on the direct cash flow statement of 440. So that increase in accounts receivable is actually a reduction of cash on the cash flow statement. Think of it this way. If 30 of revenue was not paid for by customers with cash, then the net income is overstating what the cash would be, so we reduce it by 30. Then we add back non-cash expenses, such as depreciation. Depreciation expense was 55. Then you can calculate the total, which is change in cash of 110 using the indirect method. And as always, the change in cash is the same using both approaches. Now let's look at an even more complicated period three. In this period, the following transactions took place. Cash purchases of 150, cash sales of 320, sales on credit of 310, purchases on credit of 180, receipts from receivables of 260, payments to receivables of 140, cash expenses of 70, and depreciation of 55. And again, there was no inventory left at the end of the year. You can test yourself by trying to complete the Excel exercise on your own, or you can watch in the next chapter as we demonstrate how to build the cash flow statement using both approaches. Now let's work through a solution for period three. Since this period is more complex, we're going to work through the example together in Excel. Flipping over to the Excel file now for Jonas periods 1 to 3, we're going to calculate the income statement, cash flow using direct method, and cash flow using indirect method, now in Excel. First off, the company had cash purchases of 150, so we're going to take a negative 150 and put it on the income statement. We're also going to do the same thing on the cash flow statement. So we have negative 150 on each. Next, the company has cash sales of 320, which we record as revenue on the income statement, and which we record as cash from sales on the direct cash flow statement. Next, the company has sales on credit of 310. This means we need to add to revenue in addition to the 320 we originally recorded. We're now going to add 310 of credit sales for a total of 630. Since cash was not received for those sales yet, there's no impact on the cash flow statement. Moving down the list of items, we can now add some additional purchases that remain on credit. So the initial purchases of 150 will be further added to with the purchases on credit of 180. So we deduct another expense of 180. We now have a total of 330. Since the purchases were made on credit, meaning cash was not paid for them, there's no impact on the cash flow statement. Next up on our list of transactions, we see that receipts from receivables of 260 came in. What that means is cash from sales on the direct cash flow statement is going to increase by 260. We now have cash received from sales of 580. Next up, we see that payments to payables of 140 were made. That means we go to cash purchases, 
and we add to that the payment to payables of 140. So now the total cash purchases outflow is 290. The next item, cash expenses, gets recorded on the income statement as an expense and gets recorded on the direct cash flow statement as a cash outflow. The last item that's left is depreciation, which gets recorded as an expense on the income statement. And now we are able to sum up the whole income statement and arrive at the bottom line, which is net income of 170. We can then calculate the total change in cash flow using the direct method, which was 220. Now we're ready to move on and calculate the cash flow statement using the indirect method. As always, we will start with net income, which we can link over to the income statement bottom line. Now we have to make adjustments for any changes in accounts receivable, accounts payable, and non-cash items like depreciation. First, let's calculate the change in accounts receivable. The accounts receivable balance at the start of the period was zero. And then at the end of the period was equal to the revenue minus the amount of cash for payments that were actually received. So there was an increase in accounts receivable of 50, but we actually have to reduce the cash flow by that amount since that cash was not received. Next, we calculate the change or increase in accounts payable. At the start of the period, it was zero, and then we subtract from that the difference between the purchases and the cash purchases. So this actually increases the cash flow by 40. And if we think about it, the company expensed 330 of purchases, but only actually paid cash out of 290. So this is a benefit to the business. Finally, we can link the depreciation, which gets added back since it was a non-cash expense. Once that's done, we can add up the entire indirect method and we arrive at the same number as from the direct method. Congratulations, you've now built a reasonably complex cash flow statement from scratch. So far, we've only focused on the operating cash flow statement. Now it's time to build an entire cash flow statement with all three sections. We can build one using the following pieces of information. This year's balance sheet, last year's or last period's balance sheet, and this year's income statement. Just these three documents alone will enable us to build a full cash flow statement. When financial analysts are forecasting a business's performance in the future in Excel, they will often arrive at cash flows using this method. And at CFI, this approach is used extensively in our financial modeling and evaluation courses. Now, let's get going. In order to build a full cash flow statement, the first step is to compare this year and last year's balance sheets. If assets have increased this year relative to last year, then the result is a cash outflow. On the liabilities side of the balance sheet, if liabilities have increased this year relative to last year, then it results in a cash inflow. By adding up the total of all differences for each account on the asset side and the liabilities side of the balance sheet, we can get the total increase or decrease in cash. Now, let's see how this works in practice. Here are extracts from ABC's balance sheet. Accounts receivable have increased from 80 to 150. The difference of 70 will be recorded as a cash outflow. Recall that if a company has a higher accounts receivable balance, it represents more revenue that the company has not received cash payment for. Therefore, it's a drain on cash flow. Moving on to inventory, the company's inventory balance increased from 60 to 80. 
the difference of 20 is also shown as a cash outflow, with similar logic to accounts receivable. If a company has a higher inventory balance, it has more cash that's been tied up in inventory and has not been sold yet, so it's also a drain on cash flow. Now let's look at current liabilities. The account's payable balance has gone from 30 to 50. The difference of 20 is recorded as a cash inflow, or positive impact on cash. The reason being that if a company has a higher accounts payable balance, it represents more expenses that the company has not actually paid for yet with cash. Once we have completed our analysis of this year's and last year's balance sheets, the next step is to put each of the differences into the cash flow statement. We will classify them as either operating cash flows, investing cash flows, or financing cash flows. Based on the exercise we completed in the previous chapter, how should we classify ABC Inc.'s cash flows related to changes in accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventories? The answer is that ABC Inc.'s cash flows relating to accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventories would all be classified under operating activities. If we assume that ABC's net income is 8 and its depreciation expense is 90, then the cash flow from operations would be as follows. A total operating cash flow of 28. When a difference in PP&E is observed on the balance sheet from one period to another, there are usually two reasons that that difference has occurred. The first is depreciation expense, lowering the PP&E. And the other is net capital expenditures, which increase the PP&E. Therefore, if we disaggregate PP&E into these two components, we can see where depreciation flows, which is to the operating section of the cash flow statement. And we can see where net capex flows, which is to the investing section of the cash flow statement. Now let's use an example with real numbers to see how this works in practice. Let's look at how to calculate net capital expenditure if we don't have a cash flow statement. All we need is the following three items. The opening book value of property, plant, and equipment. The closing book value of property, plant, and equipment. And depreciation expense on the income statement. Given the example below, if depreciation expense is 90 and the PP&E balances are as follows, then what is ABC Inc.'s net capital expenditure? We can calculate it as follows. We know that the formula for closing PP&E is equal to the opening PP&E number plus net capital expenditure minus depreciation and then we get the closing PP&E. Given the assumptions that we saw earlier, we had an opening balance of 810, depreciation of 90, and a closing balance of 730. Therefore, we can rearrange the formula to calculate net capex, which must be 10. This would be recorded as a cash outflow of 10 under investing activities and titled as capital expenditures. Now let's look at how to deal with retained earnings under shareholders' equity. Changes in retained earnings are usually due to two factors. The first one is adding whatever the net income or net loss was for the period to the prior period's ending retained earnings balance, and then deducting from that any dividends that were paid in the period. This results in the period's closing retained earnings balance. So, we can disaggregate this into two components and show how it flows onto the cash flow statement. The first part of retained earnings, which is net income, flows to the top of operating activities on the cash flow statement. And dividends flow to the financing section for financing activities. 